Hello, it is February 17th, 2024, and welcome once again to Political Dharma. I'm still Alan Zundell. On today's show, a media tempest over Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s Super Bowl ad, the Breaking Points podcast asks a voters focus group why they support Kennedy, and Kennedy sues Idaho over its ballot access rules, and finally, the implications of Green Party candidate Jill Stein's court case against the Federal Elections Commission. Last Sunday, a TV ad for independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. played just before the Super Bowl's halftime show and resulted in some distorted media stories. In case you haven't seen the ad, here it is. <laughs> A man for president who's seasoned through and through. A man who's old enough to know and young enough to do. Well, it's up to you. It's up to you. It's strictly up to you. American Values 2024 is responsible for the content of this advertisement. About a million people watched the Super Bowl, so clearly the ad's intention was to reach lots of people who may not have been paying close attention to the presidential race so far. By that measure, it was a success. Online searches for RFK Jr. spiked way up on Google right after the ad ran, showing that it piqued the interest of a lot of viewers. If the ad looked and sounded retro, that was deliberate. It was modeled on the TV ad for the 1960 presidential campaign of Kennedy's uncle, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And here I'm going to show you the original ad for comparison. Now, for those of you who are listening to the audio version of this podcast, I apologize because all you're going to hear is that same earworm of a jingle for the next 40 seconds. Please bear with me. Do you want a man for president who's seasoned through and through? But not so doggone seasoned that he won't try something new. A man who's old enough to know. And young enough to do. Well, it's up to you. It's up to you. It's strictly up to you. To me, the main story here was how this creative ad made a lot more people aware that a member of the Kennedy family was making an independent bid for the presidency. The ad, which reportedly cost $7 million to create and air, was paid for by the American Values 2024 Super PAC, which, as a political action committee, can accept larger donations than a candidate can as long as it acts independently of the candidate's campaign. On Monday, the New York Times' Rebecca Davis O'Brien reported that Nicole Shanahan, an environmental lawyer who describes herself as a progressive Democrat, donated $4 million towards the $7 million cost of the ad and led the group which came up with the idea for reusing the 1960 JFK ad. But instead of focusing on how the ad made lots of people interested in the Kennedy campaign, Instead, media focus tended to center on a minor controversy over who has a right to the Kennedy family heritage. RFK's cousin Bobby Shriver tweeted a complaint that the ad used his uncle's and his mother's face and said of his mother that, quote, she would be appalled by his deadly health care views. Respect for science, vaccines, and health care equity were in her DNA, end quote. Shriver's brother Mark said he agreed with him. In my opinion, RFK has as much right to claim the political heritage of John and Robert Kennedy as anyone in his family, as not only was JFK his uncle, but Robert F. Kennedy Sr. was obviously his father, and he grew up with his father and knows something about his values. Add to that that RFK Jr. is running for president right now, just like John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and his uncle Teddy did as well. 
As for using Shriver's mother's face in the ad, I doubt that anyone said, hey, that's Eunice Kennedy Shriver's face there for a split second. Kennedy must be claiming to walk in her footsteps as well. RFK responded on X that he was sorry if the ad, quote, caused anyone in my family pain, end quote, saying that the ad was created and aired by the American Value Super PAC without any consultation with him. He went on to say to his family, quote, I love you. God bless you all, end quote. News reports called this an apology and suggested it was hypocritical because Kennedy had pinned the ad to the top of his ex account. But Kennedy didn't apologize for the ad. He said he was sorry if the ad caused anyone in his family pain. Now, you can show concern about your family's feelings, even if you regard their complaint against you as baseless. And as I indicated, I regard the Schreiber brothers' complaint against RFK as baseless. Kennedy wasn't responsible for the ad, and he has as much right to claim his family's political heritage as his cousins do. By the way, Kennedy later did take down the ad from his ex account. So why did the media choose to focus on this angle? Uh, in part because controversy gets attention. But I think it also was because it enabled them to paint RFK as a hypocrite, to challenge his claim to the Kennedy political heritage, and to redirect people's attention towards the allegations that Kennedy is an anti-vaccine extremist. In other words, they were hit pieces, showing that the national media has a continuing bias against alternative candidates to the two major parties. Given this media slant, why do many voters support Kennedy? In previous episodes, I covered public opinion polls, which have consistently shown that RFK Jr. has the highest net favorability rating of all the prominent um, presidential candidates this year. But the polls haven't told us why this is so. Well, this week, Sagar and Jetty and Crystal Ball of the Breaking Points podcast helped answer that question. They sponsored a focus group of RFK supporters to ask them about their views. Here's a few short clips from the show to give you a flavor of what those voters had to say. So we've been really curious about who are the RFK Jr. supporters? What do they look like? What are the different archetypes? And we got a lot of really, really interesting data um, and insights from the focus group that we were able to do with James Johnson of JL Partners, and he's gonna join us in the studio now. Seven people who said that they are gonna vote RFK Jr. in November from the suburbs of Detroit. Now, one by one, I want you to tell me about your story of where you ended up there. His announcement was phenomenal. I thought it was one of the best speeches I've heard in a long time. I'm hungry for a change, and I want leadership. I was looking at it more toward legacy um, and the views that I grew up with. So it was a little bit deeper for me uh, that the Kennedy family <clears throat> would throw a candidate in there that um, would, would fulfill what the past Kennedys have and work for all people. Legacy and the name and for change and for the people, because I do not like, you know, our other potential candidates. He seems very confident in what he talks about. And um, he's listening to views from other people. And he's gonna be uh, willing to take on the establishment, to take on the military, in, uh, establishment and some of the entrenched political organizations that uh, you know are running our country and I just I just think overall the person will be he'll be a good fit I didn't actually uh, know about him until a random episode of Joe Rogan he was on it it's really hard to like lie for three hours straight about yourself to put on a facade and I look at Trump I don't really see integrity there I see manipulation I look at Biden I don't even see substance there I see a guy who is enough of a figurehead that a party can use. Sagar and Crystal presented several episodes this week showing the group's views on things like COVID and vaccines, who they voted for in 2020, and their views on the wars in Ukraine and Israel. I recommend that you go check out the interviews on that show, Breaking Points, which you can find on Rumble and uh, YouTube, as well as uh, 
podcast in an audio version on Spotify. I also recommend the show simply because it's a good alternative to mainstream news and commentary shows. Okay, let's turn now to RFK's ballot access issue with, oh, with uh, Idaho. Ballot Access News reported on Monday that Kennedy filed a federal lawsuit against Idaho challenging three of its requirements for an independent presidential candidate to get on its ballot in the November general election. First, it's unreasonably early March 15th deadline for submitting a voter's petition to get on the ballot. Second, it's ruled that people circulating the petition must sign an affidavit testifying that they are Idaho residents. And third, its requirement that the petition include the name of a vice presidential candidate. That third one will have wider implications if Kennedy wins his lawsuit. The Kennedy campaign has counted 21 states that require naming a vice presidential candidate to get on their ballot. Those states are colored light blue on the map on your screen if you're watching this podcast as a video. If Kennedy succeeds in striking the rule down in one state, it'll set the precedent for bringing lawsuits against the rest of those 21 states. My guess is that Kennedy's main problem with the rule is finding and vetting a willing vice presidential candidate in advance of starting a petition drive and getting it done in time for the filing deadline. Remember, the major party candidates don't have to name their vice presidential candidate until their nominating conventions, which happen in the summer. Uh, major party candidates are also pretty much guaranteed to be on the ballot in all 50 states plus the District of Columbia without circulating any kind of petition. So far, Kennedy has obtained ballot access in two states, Utah and New Hampshire, notwithstanding that multiple media outlets keep saying he has ballot access in only one state. As I've reported previously, he's also considering seeking the nomination of the Libertarian Party, which would put him on at least 36 state ballots and maybe all 50 of them. Kennedy is scheduled to speak at the California Libertarian Party State Convention next weekend, along with independent presidential candidate Cornell West, Jill Stein of the Green Party, and five Libertarian Party members seeking their party's presidential nomination. The National Libertarian Party Convention is scheduled for Washington, D.C. on May 24th through the 26th, the weekend preceding Memorial Day. That's when the party will choose its presidential nominee. And as I said last week, delegates to the Libertarian Party National Convention aren't bound to particular candidates, so they could choose Kennedy if they wanted to. If they do, it would make sense for him to choose a vice presidential candidate who has some ties to the libertarian movement, more broadly speaking. I also said there'd be mutual benefits for both Kennedy and the Libertarian Party if they both, if they both choose to go that route. For Kennedy, it gives them the opportunity to get matching funds, uh, public funding from the government, to pursue ballot access in more states. And for the Libertarian Party, it gives them the opportunity to get public funding for the presidential candidate in 2028 if they can meet the 5% threshold of the vote in the 2024 election. But there's an important caveat to accepting public funds for a campaign. On Thursday, Ballot Access News reported that the Federal Elections Commission is not going to respond to Jill Stein's petition to the U.S. Supreme Court regarding the FEC's demand that she repay $175,000 of the public funding money that she used in her presidential campaign of 2016. The case started in 2019 when the FEC started an audit of Stein's use of public funding to pursue the nomination of the Peace and Freedom Party in California in order to obtain ballot access in that state. She had already obtained the nomination of the Green Party of the United States, but the party didn't have ballot access in all the states. Here's Stein talking about the results of the FEC inquiry two years ago on Ron Placone's podcast. I got a letter from the FEC saying that I had to pay them $175,000 for um, public funding that was spent to get on the ballot, which is what the public funding was supposed to be for. And that's what we used it for in 2012. And we basically applied our experience of 2012 to 2016. So suffice it to say, I was totally blindsided by this. So at that point, because we really no longer had a campaign, this is five years after the fact, 
Five years later, I'm getting this bill, basically, this demand that I pay 175000 You know, we began to get the resources that, you know, in little bits that we could hire a first lawyer. And then eventually um, we have a second attorney as well. And he has joined in a pro bono capacity, which has been just a total lifesaver. So this is what I've done for the last, you know, going on two years now. All I do is um, fight this battle uh, with the FEC pushback. We, we participated in a um, conciliation process, which had to be confidential. So I couldn't say anything about it publicly for the first year plus. Um, and then when our conciliation succeeded in some ways, but basically failed uh, on the big stuff, um, uh, we are going to court and we are waiting for our case to be heard. We're about to file a big brief, so, which basically boils down to that there are obscure and contradictory rules uh, that the FEC uses, which really tilt the playing field against uh, grassroots players. At that point, she had just appealed the FEC decision to the courts. Then in July of last year, the Court of Appeals denied Stein's request that it overturn the FEC's decision. At the heart of the case is the issue of whether she was entitled to receive primary campaign matching funds to pursue ballot access in California because she spent them after the major parties had chosen their nominees, thus ending the primary season. Stein contended that this rule about when the primary season ended discriminated against minor parties. That's because the arbitrary cutoff of primary funding at the point at which major parties nominate their candidates prevents minor parties from continuing to pursue ballot access, which is automatically guaranteed to the major party nominees. However, the appeals court held that, according to the Supreme Court precedent in the 1976 case of Buckley v. Vallejo, if Congress can deny public funding to candidates who cannot show widespread support, it can also offer less generous funding to a minor party primary candidate than to a major party candidate. In other words, Congress can give free money to major party candidates if they have a good reason to, but that doesn't mean that they have to give anything to other candidates who can't show widespread support for their candidacy. Now, this creates a kind of catch-22 in which rules like this make it hard for minor parties to get on the ballot and thus to get as many votes as they would have. And then the failure to get a lot of votes is used as evidence that they can't justify public funding for their campaigns, the public funding that would help them get on more ballots to be able to get more votes to show more support. Circular kind of problem. So if you wonder why minor party candidates and independent candidates have a hard time getting anywhere in this system, add this to your long list of reasons. That's it for this week. The major parties didn't have any primaries or caucuses in the last week, and they won't have any this week until Saturday when the Republican Party holds its primary in South Carolina. Then on Monday, February 27th, both parties hold primaries in Michigan. If you got anything out of this show, once again, like it, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to it, share it with your friends, and uh, you can find Political Dharma, the video version on um, Rumble, <laughs> and you can also find it in various audio platforms such as Spotify and Apple and others. There's also a secure link for donations in the program description at the end where you can help support this show. And thank you to those who have sent in donations. One of the viewers said the donation was to help buy me a new shirt so I would look more presentable in these. Uh, if you want to contribute to me getting a new shirt, put that in the note when you make a donation. Or uh, comments are always welcome on these videos. So you can comment and say what kind of a shirt I would look better in. Okay. Um, so that's it for this week. Hope to see you again next week and maybe I'll be wearing a new shirt. Thanks. Please, I see the chains are breaking. We gained our focus. The moves we're making will prove to determine our self-worth as a passenger on the vehicle earth.